this morning. Dr. Ice, good morning. Thanks so much for being with us today. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I think your name is appropriate because it feels like it's cold enough out there right now that with the drizzle falling, we could get ice out of it at some point along the way here. Can you bring me me some warmer weather here, please? Is that possible? Yeah. Uh, You have some concerns over what's going on in Washington, D.C. regarding the debt limit. We all do. Uh, Yours, however, centers specifically about how this could affect health care for West Virginians. Can you give me some more information on that, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, You know, let's start off by talking about what the debt limit is and, you know, how non-controversial it's been for decades, right? So every year almost we see um, a debate over raising our debt limit, and, you know, we do that so that as a country we can we can pay our bills. And this is normally a non-controversial process that we've gone through, you know, since 1960. Congress has acted on 78 separate occasions uh, to either permanently raise, temporarily extend, revise the definition of the debt limit, and I, I want to be clear, this has always been a, a nonpartisan issue. Uh, 49 times under Republican presidents we've done it, 29 times under Democratic presidents. This is a way for the United States to stay solvent and pay its bills. What it is not is a way to hurt Americans, and specifically West Virginians. And, and let me talk about how that plays into this. Um, currently, you know, the House got their, um, uh, the the House Speaker McCarthy got his um, um, coalition together and they managed to pass a package to increase the debt limit. But also in, included in that package um, are some cuts to programs that have nothing to do with our debt limit, um, especially um, work requirements on programs that help West Virginians like Medicaid. And so if we turn it around to the the health aspect of this, what we see is that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services estimates that 220,000 West Virginian Medicaid expansion enrollees are at risk of losing their health care coverage over pieces of this debt limit legislation that need not be in there. Okay, so how does he tie in the debt limit with this requirement uh, work for Medicaid? How, what is the tie-in specifically? Have you seen it? Yeah, the tie-in um, that they're using is that um, they're going to save money from this. But what, what isn't the whole picture is that it's actually going to hurt hundreds of thousands of West Virginians. And, you know, the proposal is an attack on access to quality, affordable health care um, with particularly devastating consequences for patients with either serious, acute, or chronic illnesses. And I want to be clear that Medicaid is an insurance program for low-income Americans. It is not a work program. It is not a get-back-to-work program, not a workforce development program, none of these things. It's a health insurance program for low-income Americans. And to tie health insurance to the debt limit debate is a sort of a backdoor way of getting politics done that is disingenuous and hurtful to West Virginians. You cite an example in 2018, Arkansas imposed this requirement on people enrolled in Medicaid. And can you tell me the results of what happened in Arkansas in 2018? Yeah, in in 2018, um, Arkansas did impose work requirements on the Medicaid population. Um, And so this is not just a hypothetical or a theoretical um, result that we would expect from, from this legislation. This has actually happened, and so we can see the results. And what happened before the federal court halted Arkansas's efforts is more than 18,000 individuals, which is almost one in four, um, who already worked and who were otherwise eligible for Medicaid, lost their health care in just seven months. Do not not because they weren't working, but because they didn't do the paperwork. So it's shown us that, you know, here in West Virginia, we know that more than 50 percent of adults on Medicaid already work. And it 
you know, time-consuming monthly red tape and paperwork requirements are not met, just like they did in Arkansas, um, people will lose health care that allows them to stay healthy and to stay working. So if we think we have to have our basic needs met before we can work, that includes, you know, eating, and that includes being healthy. Dr. Ice, so I want to make sure I understand correctly, the paperwork that they did not do, it wasn't the paperwork required to be eligible for Medicaid. It was the paperwork Arkansas was requiring for them to prove that they were working to keep their Medicaid? Correct. Um, the requirements are about paperwork. So it's not, um, it's, it's bureaucratic red tape is what it is that was causing people to lose their health insurance. So it, the paperwork is not, is not something required of the employer. The paperwork is being required of the employees. They have to prove to the state that they, or in this particular case, if Speaker McCarthy's plan goes through, you'd have to prove to the federal government that you have a job. That wouldn't seem to be that difficult to prove. Why is that such a bureaucratic red tape mess? Well, because if you think about folks, they're working, they're raising their families, um, they're, they're busy living life, and if they have this onerous uh, requirement that they've got to submit paperwork monthly or every three months or whatever they would decide on, um, if, if you fall through that crack and you don't get it done for no you know reason other than maybe you didn't have access, maybe you didn't have time, whatever it could be, maybe it didn't get filed properly, all of these paperwork reasons would be why you would lose your health insurance. Not because you weren't working, um, but you just had too much of the re- requirements that you did not meet. And the paperwork requirements. When you apply for Medicaid, you have to go through a paperwork or online application of some sort to be to uh, be able to receive Medicaid benefits uh, for health care. Do you have to do anything that uh, like quarterly or semi-annually to keep Medicaid yeah. benefits? Yeah, um, you, you don't. You don't sign up for Medicaid and then get uh, lifelong access to it, of course. You still have to go through a reauthorization um, yearly and things like that. But you expect to do that. You expect to, just like we expect if we're on the marketplace, to, you know, look at our insurance plan or if we get our insurance from our employer. But this is not something we have to do every single month to remain insured. This is like a yearly thing. And in Arkansas, and I don't, I don't know about Arkansas. I'm just going by what you have here. Uh, in Arkansas, were they requiring some type of regular updates as to whether you were still employed? Was it monthly, quarterly, semi-annually? Any idea? Yeah, it was, it was monthly. Yeah, so you'd have to every single month, and it doesn't sound that bad. But when you really think about people who are um, struggling, they're low income. They're working, they're raising families, they're taking care of loved ones. You know, adding one more layer um, can really impact their access. Well, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I, I can understand the requirement of at least reporting once, but a monthly requirement that I still have a job is, I think, a little overburdensome there. John Bodwell, you well, have employees. You tell me. I, I've, got a, I've got a lot for you, doctor. I'm, I'm, I appreciate you being on. The first thing is, if you're on unemployment, you have to report every week. So people are used to that. So if you have to report every month to get free health care for yourself and your family, that is, is important. Everybody deserves health care that is being paid for by everybody else's tax dollars. You know, the least you can do is is fill out a form on a monthly basis that maybe you use the word onerous. I mean, I can't see it taking people more than about five minutes. I mean, personally, I, I'm self-employed. I'm also a, a health insurance agent. I'm a Medicare agent. I believe people deserve health insurance. But I also believe that people who can work should work, and that if you don't work and you're able to, you're, you don't really don't deserve a lot of things. Um, one of the big differences between us here in West Virginia and Arkansas, and we've had a lot of state economic leaders on recently, we have more jobs then we have people who need jobs. It's not like we have people who are who who can work who are out there looking for work and can't find it. Um, well, let me let me make a couple points here. Can, let me um, say one more thing, all, doctor. Let me finish my thought. The other okay. big point I have is during the Arkansas problem, there was not Obamacare. 
If you are in and you are low income and you are working, you will most likely qualify for an Obamacare plan with very, very low premiums based because it's all based on your income. So if you are working and you've got a family and you're struggling, you've got a chance to get on the marketplace provided your employer does not offer group coverage. I mean, I personally, I pay $2,000 a month for my health care. I have to take the time to either write that check or go online and pay it every month. I mean, the least that somebody who's getting free health care can do is do, you know, about the same amount of effort. And I believe everybody deserves health care. No question about it. A society, I mean, it's, it's a basic right, but it's also a basic right for people to take care of themselves. Well, yeah, let me make a few points. Um, first of all, I would say that Arkansas, it was under um, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. That was already um, in place when well, Arkansas... No, those, um, those plans did not begin till it did not really come full force in a 2010, 2012, and that was, that was in 08. So that's, that's, not, that's not the case. I see what you're saying. Well, let's go back to working in West Virginia. West Virginia, people on Medicaid actually already work. And um, unless, you know, unless they're exempted for various reasons, they're disabled, they're a caretaker to a loved one, things like that. But more than half of adults on Medicaid already do work. And health insurance, Medicaid is not. Uh, health insurance or is not a workforce development program so to tie it to work is disingenuous medicaid is a health insurance program it relies on your income it should not rely on can you meet paperwork uh requirements monthly over and over and over again just to show that you are still working and still low income we do a yearly reevaluation of income and it's it's based on income and it's a health insurance program that's what it is that's what it was designed to be that's what it's designed to do is to keep our low-income workers healthy and imposing these work requirements is going to make it harder for about 220,000 West Virginia Medicaid expansion enrollees to stay healthy well, most of the, I mean, most of the issue with the, the Medicaid expansion enrollees is the same thing that's going to happen in most states. There was Medicaid expansion during COVID, and also for the last couple of years, people automatically remained on Medicaid. There was no recertification process. So everyone kept their Medicaid. A lot of people who are going to lose Medicaid are going to lose Medicaid because, thankfully, over the past few years, incomes have risen. I mean, Sheets is starting at, what, $17 an hour now, where it was probably, you know, 10 11 before. Many people who lose Medicaid now, the vast majority are going to lose Medicaid because they're making more money. They're doing better. The, the marketplace love, has corrected itself. Yeah, we love having people move up the economic ladder. We are excited when people can do better economically for themselves and their families. But we know from other work requirements, um, efforts in areas like um, SNAP benefits and, and other, other experiments like that, they don't increase workforce participation. They don't encourage more work. They don't help people get back to work. They're just paperwork burdens. Well, and, and they are. I mean, I, I personally believe that, that the ill, the infirm, the elderly, people taking care of, of loved ones where they can't work should have Medicaid. But I also believe that people who are perfectly healthy and have the ability to work should be working. I mean, at whatever they're doing. And if their income is low enough, even with their work, then they, they should be able to get Medicaid. But, I mean, I know the Obamacare levels, and we do a lot of work with Obamacare. The Obamacare income levels are very, very low where people can get in, and some families are paying, you know, nothing. Some families are paying $50, $100 a month to have an Obamacare policy, and that is a a once-a-year recertification, as you said at the beginning. Um, I mean, I understand. I mean, what they're saying is we're spending too much money. you, You talked about the debt ceiling at the beginning. That's debt. I mean, I don't know in your household, but in my household, we don't say, all right, well, you know, it's time to get another credit card because we want to advance more debt. 
at some point the debt has to slow down and it's got to slow down in every facet and if it if it helps to get people working keep people working keep people feeding themselves feeding their families by saying hey i don't get to keep my health care if i don't have a job and i don't prove it once a month then I, I don't see the big deal with it. It's not onerous to spend two minutes a month probably going on a website just like they do with unemployment and clicking a button saying, yes, I'm still working. I'm still working at the same place. Click. I keep my Medicaid. Um, you know, on the surface, that sounds good. But what if you don't have access to the Internet? What if um, you don't have a telephone? What if you, your only option is to visit the DHHR office? But you're working, right? Um, there's a lot of, of factors that go into this. And, and one of the things that I do want to say is healthy people work. Healthy people, healthy people don't work. Well, and a lot and of, and a lot of so healthy people without, don't work, unfortunately. And, you know, the people that are working um, and using Medicaid, they have a chance to be healthier and move up economically. But what they, what we shouldn't be doing is attacking America's most vulnerable, including 220,000 West Virginians themselves, over paperwork that doesn't even help. Dr. Ice, uh, have you seen the actual requirements Speaker McCarthy has proposed in regards to what specifically would be required and how much time is required to complete the requirements? Uh, that was yeah, that was part of his um, negotiation with with the Republicans in the House was um, how strict should these be? How many hours should people be required to work? How often should they have to submit paperwork? Um, this is a debate that I think people are willing to have, but to wrap it up and this idea of our debt limit, is a sort of a backdoor politics way of debating something that we can talk about. But when you wrap it up in the debt limit, and, and I want to say um, to your point about debt and that, the national budget is not like a household budget. Um, countries run debts. They run deficits every year. That's normal. Um, it's been normal for at least the last three quarters of a century. That's just how federal budgets work. So um, up in, you know, like I said, for the past six, seven, eight decades, we have seen this not be controversial. Dr. Jessica Ice is the executive director of West Virginians uh, for Affordable Health Care, and it is a Republican-dominated House. I'm not sure uh, how far the Republicans will get with the Democrats controlling the Senate and a Democrat in the White House in regards to any requirements that will be added on to extending the debt limit, that appears to be headed for some type of uh, Armageddon-type showdown at the end of this month. But uh, I presume you're encouraging the audience to get in touch with Carol Miller and Alex Mooney, the two elected uh, congressmen and congresswomen here in West Virginia, to tell them to say no to this. But my guess is they won't listen because they're both Republicans and they're going to vote the way Speaker McCarthy wants them to vote. So my thought on this is that the practical way out of this is to try to make sure that whatever requirements are imposed are at least requirements that don't burden people too extensively. And by that, I mean, don't go on a website that you can't get onto if you remember what it was like trying to get on the website the first year for the Affordable Health Care Act. Uh, make sure the website is accessible and make sure that, as John said, it's like unemployment. You can get in and get out and not spend half your day trying to figure your way through it. Uh, that appears to be the more practical way to approach this to me, uh, Dr. Rice, at least at this point. Would you agree or not? Well, I'm going to, I'll, I'll stick with the point that we know that work requirements do nothing to help the workforce. That's the first point. If we want to debate policy um, that will actually help working West Virginians, we need to, you know, ask the Senate, um, you know, since they already passed in the House, we need to ask the Senate to think about, um, you know, what will this do for West Virginians and how will this hurt 220,000 West Virginians? Well, and instead say, why don't we debate work policies that actually support work? Why don't we talk about things that help people thrive? 
high quality job training, making child care more affordable, paid sick leave. These are things that have been shown to help people work and increase their economic capacity. Work requirements have been shown time and again to do the opposite. Dr. Ice, you've repeatedly said people who work, people who work, and I agree with you. And, you know, there may be, you know, one quarter of 1% of people who don't have a cell phone who can't report. You keep saying people who work. So do you agree that, that people who don't work and are capable of working should be removed from the Medicaid rolls? Because it's obvious they don't want to take a part in supporting their families working and doing what they need to do. So, I mean, those people should be removed. I mean, is, is that, I mean, do you agree with that point? I'm going to disagree with that because I'm going to go back to one of the points that I made originally. Medicaid is a health insurance program. It is not a work program. It is a health insurance program, and to tie it to work is, is uh, really beyond the scope of what the program was designed to be. But is it fair for people who work and work hard, even the working poor who are paying taxes, is it fair for all of us to pay for health insurance when a lot of us pay an onerous amount of money for health insurance? Is it fair for us to have to pay for people who are capable of working and don't choose to? Oh, fair. That's a that's a loaded that's a loaded word. What I will say is that what is fair is having a healthy society. Um, you're in any society, you're going to have people on all sorts of of a spectrum where they where they fall. But it is to everyone's benefit if if people are healthy. For example, um, you know, say I'm a mother and I am, and I'm on Medicaid. I don't. Let's pretend I don't work. What does that do for my family, though? For us to have Medicaid, it makes my children's prospects higher in the future. Um, there was a study that came out about 20, 30 years after the uh, Medicaid program was first developed. And what it showed was that parents who had medic access to Medicaid after the program was passed, their children scored higher in every measure that you could think of. Educational achievement, um, wages earned, health outcomes, chronic disabilities, all of these things. So having parents and families healthy makes the whole state healthier. I, I, and I agree. Saves money. And I agree. And these parents should should want to have the, the work ethic or the desire to do what they should do. But I, I mean, and I believe 100 percent, regardless of the parent, the children should all be covered. And they are under West Virginia chip, whether it's Medicaid or not. The children get covered. The elderly get covered. The ill, the infirm. I am merely talking about people who are capable of working and choose not to. People who would rather sit home doing whatever they do and not working. Do they deserve society to pay for their health coverage? I do not believe so. Well, I, I think that the number of people that, uh, that that would encompass is probably fairly small. But I'm actually talking about a study that showed parent access to health insurance, to Medicaid, is what made children's outcomes better. So regardless of if their parent worked or didn't work or any of that, just having access to reliable affordable, accessible health care made their children's futures better. Dr. Rice, we're just about out of time. What would you like our audience to do based on this conversation today? You know, I would like them to, to speak with our senators, um, Capito and Manchin, and say, you know, think about West Virginians. Think about putting West Virginians first. Don't let the fight over this debt ceiling impact health care. Do not let 220,000 West Virginians risk losing their coverage over red tape. Dr. Rice, thank you for the robust conversation on this topic. Much appreciated. Thanks, doctor. Oh, yes, I appreciated it. Thank you.